I'm going to talk about how Yeshua defines a true disciple. Sister Becky was all in my message because that's how the Spirit works. But you also have uh, Sister Beth earlier in, in a Sabbath class was all, was all in the message because that's how the Spirit works. Amen? Amen. Praise Yahweh. So raise your hand if you consider yourself a disciple of Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah. All right. Very good. When we were first saved, the Master Yeshua, we, you know, he came and, and dwelt in us. He, he forgave us sin. But he had a clear calling for our life. And we want to know, what did he mean when he welcomed us to this new life in him? What did he mean? Today, we're going to be looking at what Yeshua teaches, not what Pastor Anthony teaches, but what Yeshua teaches in Luke chapter 14. Amen? So if you all would turn to the book of Luke chapter 14, we're going to talk about the cost of following Yeshua. When you get there, say the cost. All right. <clears throat> now we're going to read. It says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me and cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to, to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to, you know, to, to see if he has enough to complete? And I don't know if I gave you guys the first verse. First verse, we started in verse 25. Now we um, are in verse 27 at the end. We're starting, or actually 28, and we're starting 29. Otherwise, when he have laid a foundation and is not able to finish all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, The man began to build and was not able to finish. Of what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks, for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all, say all, his own possessions. Therefore salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has the ear to hear, let him hear. Amen? Let's, let's pray for a minute. Great and mighty Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open up our ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us about true disciple. And let us, Father Yahweh, be the disciples you desire us to be. Not that we desire, but that you desire to be. And everyone said? So, the following are actual responses from comment cards given to the staff members of Bridger Wilderness Area. One, co one card said, Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Too many bugs, said another one, and leeches and spiders and, web, and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these pests. Please pave the trails. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to the wonderful views without having to hike to them. Uh, the coyotes made too much noise, said another one last night, and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. A small deer came to my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? Please call, said the note. Another note said escalators would help on steep uphill sections. A McDonald's would be nice at the tra trailhead, you know? Two, and one, and one said, said, there are too many rocks in the mountains. You know? So these comments and complaints indicate that these people who made, who made themselves um, um, do not really understand what it means to stay in the wilderness. They, don't, they were looking for something convenient and, and comfortable, but not truly a wilderness experience. 
Am I right? In a similar way, many people today do not understand what it means to be a genuine Christian. There are multitudes that often follow Yeshua or claim to be a Christian, but they do not do so in a term. They do so on their own terms, not on Yeshua's term. Amen? And so they do not truly comprehend the biblical definition of discipleship. Because of this ignorance, there are many who consider themselves to be followers of Yeshua, but who are not. Even though in many ways they do look like followers of Yeshua. They go to church on Sabbath. They have a profession of faith. They read their Bibles, pray, even give in the offering. But they are not the real deal. Or at least are not living or thinking like the real deal. Yeshua confronts these these problems. He confronts them today. I want you to know, today he's confronting them. And he makes it very clear what it means to be a Christian. And therefore, there should be no reason in anybody's mind. No no one here should be ignorant or self-deceived. Because you can deceive yourself. Is that right? Am I right? Let me hear your your response. So we will take a look at how Yeshua defined discipleship in the next few moments. We're going to go over what he says verse by verse. But before we do, I want to explain the word disciple, which is repeated several times in these few verses. A disciple is a true follower, say follower, Follower. or learner, say learner, learner, which is basically the same thing. When we follow him, we're learning from him, and we're learning from him, we're following him, both in what we do and what we say. It's not just a mental extent. Amen? You know, we're learners of Yeshua the Messiah. In other words, what we would call a Christian, if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. If you are not a disciple of Yeshua, as Yeshua defines it, no matter how much church you attend, no matter how much you say you're a Christian, you are not a Christian. There's two terms. These two terms, disciple and Christian, they mean the same thing. Say synonymous. That means the same thing. They're synonymous. In the same way that when I talk about my wife, Denise, and, and I say that she is my spouse or my wife, it means the same thing. So you cannot be a Christian without being a disciple. You cannot be a disciple without being a Christian. And a disciple as described by Yeshua is what we're looking at. Okay, so in fact, here's a little trivia. The term disciple occurs 269 times in the New Testament while the term Christian only occurs three times. Keeping your thumbs in Luke, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 11, 26. And when you get there, say, Christian disciple. Thank you, Ray. It's Acts, chapter 11, 26. Say, Christian disciple, and I'll know you're there. All right. We're told that the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, okay? All right? So this makes clear that the terms are interchangeable. Can you see that? A disciple is a Christian, and a Christian is a disciple. I wanted this to be clear because I believe it greatly clarifies the seriousness of what the Master, the Lord Yeshua, was saying in Luke 14, 27. So let's turn back to Luke 14, 27. So we look at what Yeshua's words there, and we see, and we we get there and say, the master is serious. All right, very good. He says, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This, I want you to know, could also be phrased as anybody who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be a Christian. That phrasing somehow gets our attention more and clarifies the seriousness of the issue or subject that Yeshua is teaching about. Now, with this brief explanation, let's look at the passage verse by verse. Let's go over it again and break it down. Let's go to uh, verse 25. Again, now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me 
and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The first thing I want you to notice is to whom Yeshua is speaking these words about being his disciple. Luke notes specifically that large crowds were following Yeshua and that Yeshua specifically turned to them and elaborated on being a disciple. Yeshua was not talking to those who were antagonistic towards him or to those that were uninterested in his life and message. No, these were people who were traveling with Yeshua, just like those of us who sit in church today. These people are positive in their attitude towards Yeshua. They were interested in what he had to say. They apparently mistook this positive attitude and interest in Yeshua for true discipleship. And they do this as many of us do today. They consider themselves to be followers of Yeshua, but in reality, they were only casual followers or fans. How many of you are reading the book, uh, Not a Fan? Amen. So you know what I'm talking about. And if you aren't reading it, you should read it. It's a very good book. You know, but they were just casual followers or fans. They were not committed. Say committed. Amen. Committed followers. They were not. They were willing to even and even anxious to follow Yeshua, providing that the cost was not too high or the demands too great. They were like many people today who do Christian things like go to church, pray, sing Christian songs, call themselves Christians, but are not really committed to Yeshua. In a sense, they were along for the ride. But they were unwilling to give up everything in their lives that conflicted with following with Yeshua in a committed way. They were like many today who looked to Yeshua to solve their money problems. They said, Yeshua... Oh, I'm having troubles in my, with my relationship. Oh, fix it. Oh, Yeshua, I'm having health problems. I might die. Oh, you know, they, they, this is how they are. But they, when it comes to, to actually obeying Yahweh, they're unwilling. They, they quickly grow disillusioned. When it be because, you know, Yeshua, his followers, want, they are to sacrifice. They are to, just like the song we sang, give their all. Say, give their all. Amen? So I want you to ask you, yourself a question. Which one are you? Are you a casual follower? Or are you a committed follower? Are you a follower of Yeshua only when he's going your way? But as soon as he's not going your way, or it means you have to give up something you really want, you're not willing to obey him? The Master Yeshua addresses this mistaken understanding of discipleship in verses 26 and 27. He explains in vivid and clear terms what it means to be a disciple of his. Read with me. Verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, this is Yeshua saying this, and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So in summary, Yeshua's message in these two verses is to be his disciple, you must be committed to him ab above everything else. So yes, I want you guys to know that this is an interactive uh, message. Okay? Interactive. That means I want you to say something. So when I say um, to be his disciple, you must be what? I want you to say, committed to him above everything else. Matter of fact, I want you to be like really strong, but I want you to be like, committed to him above everything else. All right? All right. Because so I want to know you're paying attention. I want to keep you alive. I don't want you to fall asleep on me. All right? So let's get into practice drill. You ready? To be his disciples, you must be what? Committed to him above everything else. Beautiful. Remember that. Okay, I'm going to see if you're sleeping now. I'll catch you on this. Okay, this message goes into how much we love Yeshua, how much we value him in our hearts 
as Lord and Savior. In our hearts, Yeshua must come before our loved ones, self-interest, before possessions, careers, before hobbies, before goals in life, and even our very lives, because we know that he is more valuable than all these, right? Is he more valuable than all these? So it is not enough to simply proclaim this with our words. The proof of our love is found in our practice of how we live. Amen? It's in living in the dark and corrupt world that our commitment to Yeshua will be tested. And, and, and sometimes in the moments of weakness, Yeshua will not come first in our choices. Amen? Am I the only one that has made a choice where Yeshua did not come first? Huh? I, well, see, I'm glad, glad to know there's a few of you that, that, that say you're, that you, you made bad choices too. This happened to Peter, did it not? Peter, in a moment of weakness, betrayed Yeshua three times before the cock crowed, right? You know? Genuine disciples, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, genuine disciples, say genuine disciples, disciples. have made a sincere commitment in their hearts and will not continue to put other things before Yeshua. See, unlike Judas, Judas, if you remember, he, he even, he, this, the Bible talks about how he stole from, from the tithes and the offerings. He had money on, the, on his mind, and his mind on his money. And, but it wasn't on Yeshua, right? He put money before Yeshua. Judas ultimately proved himself not to be a genuine disciple. Peter repented, and as a genuine disciple, Put Yeshua before everything, valuing the Lord Yeshua, even above his own life. As you know, tradition says that he was hung upside down because he chose to be, because he didn't consider himself worthy to be hung upright like his, like his Savior, his Master, his Lord. Amen? You know? He valued Yeshua that much. Do you, brothers and sisters? Look at, look at verse 26 with me. Yeshua says that this commitment level applies to anyone who comes to me. Say anyone who comes to me. In other words, don't think that Yeshua is, is just speaking exclusively to a special group of Christians such as apostles, the pastor, the evangelist, and missionaries, or, or just or mature believers. He's talking about anyone, even the smallest one child that comes to him is supposed to have this commitment. Amen? You don't have to be a pastor to have this commitment. All people who come to him for salvation must have this commitment. Amen? Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, the Master Yeshua says this commitment applies to all of us. If you've come to Yeshua for salvation as Lord and Savior over your life, this applies to you. Amen? Yeshua goes on to say, anyone who comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. Now the word hate, here, we're breaking it down, is not meant to be taken literally. Okay? But is rather used figuratively to express a point. It is hyperbole or exaggeration similar to what we use when we say the man was as big as a house, right? In, in Jewish culture, the word hate was used to express lesser love. Say lesser love. So Yeshua is saying that we must love him much. Say much. More. Say more. Then we love our closest family relationships or even our own lives. We must love him more. Say more. Then our hobbies. More, say more, more, than our goals in life. More, say more, more, than our careers. More than our own self-interest. Amen? Do you agree with me? Yes. Yeshua is not speaking of our emotional feelings towards him or, or our families, but rather he is speaking of our level, say our level, our of commitment. Amen? He is saying that our commitment is to obey and follow him. You know, our, our commitment to obey or follow him must be much greater than any other commitment in our lives. 
Hallelujah. Can you imagine that? Is that you? Is your commitment to follow Yeshua greater than any other commitment in your life? In other words, Yeshua must be the first in your priorities and your loyalties. Is this true in your life? For instance, if following Yeshua obediently results in problems or interferes with your closest relationships, will you still follow him? This is not just a mere hypothetical situation. In this very church, we've had people who profess to be committed followers of Yeshua fall away because that commitment resulted in problems with or interfered with romantic pursuits. We've had professed committed to, to following Yeshua mothers or parents who've fallen away because they refuse to put following Yeshua's words, his teachings, before their children. They don't value or love Yeshua above their, committed, their commitment to their children. So their commitment to Yeshua gets neglected. In other countries... Following Yeshua can sometimes mean being kicked out of your family, losing your children. Am I right? In, in our own country, many relationships have encountered problems because one spouse was a committed Christian and the others was not. In such cases, Yeshua wants us to know up front from the door what it means to be a disciple. He, say he, must come before even your closest relationships. Are you committed to Yeshua and his teachings, even if it means having your kids, wife, or husband turn against and be estranged from you? Are you? Let's, let's keep your thumb there, and let's look at the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 10. When you get to Matthew chapter, chapter 10, say committed. Do not think, that we'll look at verse 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. This is Yeshua talking, not Pastor Anthony. Not, you know, this is not my opinion. This is the Lord Yeshua, who you say is your Lord, and I do too. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake, say my sake which means you're talking, you're Yeshua talking, will find it. See, this is real, folks, right? Sister Becky talk, talked about, you know, I, she was real with him. But Yeshua, he, he gets real with us, I want you to know, right? This is real. This is our Lord Yeshua himself saying this. He knew that the cost of following him would, for many, mean the destruction of our relations with even our own family members. We've experienced this as a church who follows Yeshua's teachings concerning this fellowship of rebellious members who refuse to repent from sin. This has caused some of us ourselves to sin by falling away. By, we fail to obey the Master Yeshua's teaching because the disfellowship members happen to be family. So we, in disobedience, we, we stay in fellowship with bad company because they're family. And we and don't even seem to realize that our morals, as far as commitment to Yahshua, are being corrupted. We don't even realize it. Let's turn back to Luke 14. Back to Luke 14. To be Yeshua's disciples, he says, you must be what? Uh-oh, I caught some of you sleeping. <laughs> to be Yeshua's disciples, he says, you must be what? Amen, amen. Hallelujah. We must not only love or be committed to Yeshua more than to our own loved ones, we must 
also be committed to him above even our own lives. Say your own lives. As Yeshua says in verse 26, this refers to our physical lives, which we must be willing to surrender for Yeshua, for his sake. It also refers to our self lives. And what I mean by self lives, it, it means our personal desires, goals, interests, and even needs. Even needs. Say even needs. even needs. We must be committed to Yeshua above our bank accounts. Hallelujah. Our public image. Are you willing to be embarrassed publicly for Yeshua's sake? Hallelujah. Our jobs. Every personal desire, we must be committed to him above that. If following Yeshua means forfeiting these things, then we must be willing to do that. Again, this is not a hypothetical situation. Following Yeshua will many times mean making such sacrifices. To be Yeshua's disciples, he says, you must be what? Committed to Yahshua above everything else. That's right. Yeshua uses a metaphor in verse 27. Look at verse 27. To reemphasize this point. Everyone present was familiar with what Yeshua was referring to when he, when he talked about carrying his cross. The cross was a cruel form of punishment used by the Romans. The criminal was forced to carry his cross to the place of execution. Say place of execution. Place of execution. Everyone knew that this person was saying goodbye to everything. There would be no turning or coming back. Yeshua uses this vivid illustration with the intent of showing us that following him requires the same kind of saying goodbyes. Say goodbye. goodbye. To our own will, say goodbye. goodbye. To our own desires because of our commitment to him. Amen? The sad fact is since we were first saved, or if we ever picked up our cross at all, many have since left their first love of Yeshua and have put down that cross. Remember, since we were supposed to be a living sacrifice, unlike a dead sacrifice, we have the ability to, to climb off of the altar of sacrifice laid, right? It's like the song we sang, Is your on the altar of sacrifice? A dead sacrifice can't get off the altar, can it? But we're supposed to be a, li be a living sacrifice. And as a living sacrifice, we have the ability to put down our cross, to climb off of the altar. And since many of us aren't picking up our cross or have discontinued carrying it, it means that we have become no longer willing to sacrifice or say goodbye. Say goodbye to our own will and desires. It means our flesh is ruling. We are no longer willing, indeed, these to love Yahweh with all our heart, minds, and soul. And for the same reasons, many of us are no longer willing to, to follow the related command and continuing loving our neighbor as ourself. It may cost something, you know, but we're not willing to give it up. Now, some of you may think that this requirement is, is, is of total commitment or sacrifice to be a follower of Yeshua is contradictory to what Scripture truth says that salvation is a free gift, right? You say, how can it be a free gift if I have to give so much, if I have to sacrifice so much, right? Is that, is that cross some of you guys' mind? Well, here's the illustration that may help you. Suppose... I had a desire to climb Mount Everest, okay? And I don't have such a desire. But suppose that I did desire to climb Mount Everest, you know? But it cost about $70,000 more than I have. I can't afford it. I'm broke. And, and so, but I, I need that much money to do it. And I don't have that kind of money. Suppose a wealthy businessman heard of my desire and offered to pay for the entire expedition. He would buy all the expenses, expensive clothing and the expensive gear. He would pay for my transportation, the guides, and the training. It's totally free for me. But if I accept his free offer, I have just committed myself to months of difficult training and, 
and hard effort. It could even cost me my very life because many good climbers died trying to climb Mount Everest. It is a free and yet very costly, you know, training, right? Or, or adventure that, that, that I'm, I'm on. So, say free, but very costly. Free, but very costly. That, you guys get, get, get my point? Yeah. Amen. It doesn't contradict. Look at verses 28 through 30, 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and it was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up his own possessions. In these two illustrations, Yeshua is expressing one simple but pertinent point. His point is that just like it is prudent to consider the cost involved in building a tower or going to war before jumping in with both feet, right? Right? All right? Say, say look before you leave. All right? Before, just like it's prudent to, to, to do that before building a tower or going to war, it's prudent to count the cost before becoming a disciple. Amen? Every person needs to know from the get-go, but they're not being taught this in the churches. They're being taught uh, prosperity, and they're being taught um, it's an easy road, and, and you, you, can, you, know, you don't have any, any struggles and all this other stuff. But they're, you know, make it, name it, claim it, you know, and all this crazy stuff. But they're not being taught. This is not the message Yeshua is teaching, is it? Oh, Yahweh, help us, right? Say, Yahweh, help us. Everybody needs to know that they, 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 Yeshua doesn't want us to take this half-heartedly. He wants us to, to be committed from the door to, and to know and have an understanding, to seriously think about this decision. He, again, he doesn't want a half-hearted, blind commitment. You know, because what will happen if you're, if you're blind and you go into it with unrealistic expectations? When it gets hard, what are you going to do? What is the new believer going to do? Fall. That's right. You know, he doesn't want us to only expect blessings. Yes, we do expect blessings. The blessings will far outweigh, but there's cost. And the cost is everything. One should consider and make sure one is willing to pay the cost prior to making the commitment. Yeshua wants us to ask ourselves, am I in this for the long haul? Jamie and Leo, they said, for richer or for poorer, for better or for worse, you know, so sickness and health, tell death do us part. They're saying they're in it for the long haul. When you come to Yeshua for the first time, you're committing to be married to him, espoused to him for the long haul. Amen? Yeshua wants you to know this. It ain't going to be easy being his bride. All right? You know? Yeshua is asking us, are you willing to follow me no matter what happens or what you're required to give up? There is only one way to truly follow Yeshua. He says, to be my disciples, you must what? <laughs> ah, you guys, committed to him above everything else. Amen? We must be what? Hallelujah. Unlike many people today, including many preachers who are only interested in large crowds. He wants committed. Yeshua, you know, Yeshua wasn't interested in numbers, was he? No. So therefore, we should not be, as, as, as leaders of the church, interested in numbers. Yeshua wasn't interested in large crowds. They didn't impress him. But what he wanted was totally committed people. I don't care if 
all, half, I do care, but if half of you guys leave, it's about the, the, the little bit of committed people. That's what it's about, because that's what Yeshua is about. Because isn't Yeshua, wasn't he totally committed to us? Did he give some of himself to us? Amen. So he expects nothing less. Amen. Yeshua, he, he doesn't want to be unequally yoked. He wants a bride like himself. Amen. Amen. So, unlike many people today, you know, many people who have not listened to Yeshua, they, but they think that they're true disciples. They're a part of the crowd. They sit in the church, um, you know, and they, they believe that they're disciples, but they have not considered the cost. The total commitment is lacking in them, you know? And even though they gave a profession of faith, and that, is, and, that, and that is true. This is why we see that the church today doesn't look like, like a church should. It doesn't look like Yeshua. It looks like the world, right? Polls have been done, for example, that recent ones that show that, that many of those who call themselves Christians are just like non-Christians. They're living, you know, shacked up without being married. They're just as likely as non-Christians to do that. Many people who call themselves Christians are, are just as likely to get a divorce as a non-Christian. Many people, you know, call themselves Christians are just as likely to be using recreational drugs and are, are watching rated R, rated X movies, you know, as non-Christians. Isn't that sad? Because they don't understand the commitment. These kinds of things, moral compromises, Half-hearted commitments would not be happening if people really understood what was required of disciples and they had to consider the cost of Yeshua, to consider the cost that he himself instructed. People are not reading their Bible, saints. Are you reading your Bible? Are you studying to show yourself approved? Turn with me to verse 33. Yeshua once again makes clear the cost of following him. He says the disciple must be willing to give up everything. Say everything. everything. See, everything is a fairly inconclusive word, right? He's like, you can say, where, do, where does every, everything stop? You know? But it doesn't. Everything means what? Everything. everything, right? But Yeshua is referring to an attitude of the heart in which these things don't have priority over obeying Yeshua in our lives. The Greek word translated as give up can also be translated as say goodbye or renounce. Aren't we supposed to say goodbye or renounce our old way of life and our old selves? Yeshua says that we must be willing to renounce or forsake anything when it interferes with following him faithfully and completely. So to be Yeshua's disciple, he says we must be what? Look at, read 34 through 35 with me. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, salt is routinely used by Yeshua in figurative ways because of the high value people placed on salt in ancient times. Salt was used as a preservative, flavoring, and as a fertilizer. Salt, in this case, represents a person's commitment to Yeshua. When that commitment is complete, when that salt is good, this means that the Christian life will have a positive, useful purpose in the same way that the salt is, did for the people. See, salt in Yeshua's day wasn't pure like salt is today. So it could, by various means, lose its saltiness. If this happens, the remaining product had the appearance of salt, but with none of the benefits. It could not even be used for fertilizer, as Yeshua says. It is fit neither for the soil or the manure pile. In other words, it was useless in every respect. The church looking like the world is useless in every respect. If you are, say you're a Christian and you're, and you're living with your 
unmarried boyfriend. You're, 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 you, I don't care how much you say you're a Christian. It's useless. You're not being seasoned. You're not flavoring for Yeshua. Yeshua is saying that people who follow him without total commitment are like the salt that lost his saltiness. They may have the appearance of being his disciples, but they cannot be used in the kingdom as a Christian should. Yeshua was referring to those who only give a part of themselves, of their lives to him. They will commit to following Yeshua one day a week, but not seven. They will commit to obeying him in their marriage, but maybe not in their finances. They will give up this thing, but not that thing to follow Yeshua. This half-hearted commitment will not work in the same way salt that has lost its saltiness is of no use. You will also be of no use to Yeshua. To be Yeshua's disciples, he says, you must be what? See, Yeshua concludes his teaching by saying, he who has ears, let him hear. Right? He said this to remind us of our responsibility to listen. Say listen. listen. And respond. Say respond. respond. See, it's not good enough to listen. Not just good enough to be just a hearer of the word, but you must, we must be a doer of the word. Amen? We, we must listen and respond to this difficult message. The teaching is not difficult to understand, but is it difficult to accept? Amen? So here's the conclusion. There's this, in Leadership Magazine, they once read a, a cartoon that showed a church building with a billboard in front that, that said, The Light Church, 24% fewer commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe, 15 minute sermons. 45-minute worship service. We have only eight commandments, your choice. We use just three scriptural laws and have an 800-year millennium. Everything you wanted in a church and less. You know, uh, is that the kind of church you want to be a part of? No. Uh, some of us act like we do. The cartoon may represent what people are looking for in a church but to follow Yeshua, one must be totally committed. I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, what a Christian is as Yeshua defined it. Not as you defined it or I defined it, but as who defined it? Yeshua. Right? The question we need to ask ourselves is not, am I able to follow Yeshua completely? But rather, am I willing to follow Yeshua completely? Amen? We are all humans, and sometimes... We will fail in our commitment, but the thing Yeshua is confronting here is not our ability, but our willingness to follow him with our whole hearts. Amen? If we do that, he'll give us the abilities. Amen? Do you believe him? For those of you who are, who are not Christians, you need to understand what following Yeshua really means before you make that commitment. For the majority of you in here, who are already Christians, let this lesson be a reminder of what being a Christian and a disciple truly means. To be Yeshua's disciple, he says, you must what? Yahweh bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Hallelujah.